about 24 hours from now that I will email out to all the attendees. In addition, uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently, where you can ask questions real time throughout the webinar. Just use the fa uh, chat functionality in the bottom right-hand corner, and I will address those questions with Malden Zazak, the presenter today. Okay, a little bit about the presenter. Malden Sazak is Manager of Rotating Machines Technical Services within Iris Power Canada. He has more than 20 years' experience in design and testing of electrical power equipment. Uh, he has a re uh, BS degree in electrical engineering, and he's a senior member of the IEEE and a registered professional engineer in Ontario, Canada. So, Malden, thank you, and you can begin. Okay, thank you, Haley. Uh, welcome to everyone. Rather than starting this uh, webinar with uh, bad news and good news, I'll try to start it with uh, two times good news. Good news is that we are back again. Uh, Iris Qualitrol Rotating Machine Seminar webinars are starting a new cycle. And another good news is, as Haley said, we're going to be half an hour. So it will be shorter than before. Anyway, so to start, basically we are talking about uh, maintenance and there are different methods of doing that. Um, simplest one may be doing nothing, waiting for a problem to happen and then correct the problem. Second one might be a little bit more proactive, time-based or preventive. But again, it's not necessarily appropriate for the condition of the machine. And the one that we'll be talking about today is condition-based or predictive or CBM approach, which gives you opportunity to prioritize maintenance and um, to address the things as they are required rather than based on a calendar schedule, which might be premature or might be too late for certain machines. To make a difference between the offline testing and online monitoring, I will show the slide basically indicating that in online, machine is running, and uh, some sensors will have to be installed there in order to collect data, either with continuous monitor or portable. Yeah. So online monitoring implies both uh, periodic data collection or continuous data collection. On the other hand, offline is done when machine is stopped or necessarily disassembled. And uh, there will be different uh, units brought to generate uh, voltage or current or whatever is required to perform the test. So there are big differences, and uh, they are listed here in uh, offline versus online. In offline method, machine is out of service, so that is a basically expensive proposition. Uh, we don't make money. Uh, and in addition to that, test conditions are not similar to online regime of the operation. There is no load, winding is cold, there is no vibration, and so on. When we do online tests, in that case, uh, once we install the sensor, we can approach the machine with the test equipment anytime we want, and uh, that implies normal operation voltage and temperature, which is useful in uh, data analysis and understanding of the problems within the machines. So today's topic is hydrogenerator monitoring, and there is a cross-section of the one hydrogenerator indicating uh, basically a couple of things that could be monitored on a stator, rotor, on a space between the stator and rotor, which is air gap bearings and on a shaft. So I'll start with the online partial discharge monitoring and uh, we'll explain basically what is partial discharge. It is a process taking place in or on insulation of the stator winding and uh, the reason, reason for this process is uh, basically different um, the electric strength of the air which surrounds the insulation or might be trapped in insulation and the solid insulation. So as a result of that, uh, differences in a property of the, of the solid dielectric and an uh, air gap or a void that could be existing in insulation, uh, the process might be created as a result of the operational voltage. Uh, we will be trying to detect the changes in our in a, in a, in a, in a insulation by monitoring the partial discharge. And uh, luckily, this is a process that gives you a lot of warning. So this is something that uh, does not happen overnight. Uh, problems can be spotted um, early and addressed during the, the, the uh, next shutdown rather than to be surprised with the, with the, with the problems uh, in operation and clipping of the machine. Uh, most of the problems that exist in insulation can be detected using online and offline methods and they are complementary. So there is no perfect online and there is no perfect offline method. They need to be used together. Advantage of online method is it will give you opportunity to learn a little bit more and to prepare for offline tests once you have opportunity to do it. 
some of the problems in insulations are shown on following uh, slides. Uh, one of the problems is visible here. It's a basically delamination or splitting of the tapes of insulation in, inside of the solid insulation of the stator winding. Some problems could be on the surface, like this one, uh, basically interface between the semiconductive and the grading paint is not properly done. So you can see on some of the bars there is evidence of partial discharge, this white powder, and on some of the bars there is no evidence. The reason is that bars without white strip are not energized to sufficiently high voltage. They are closer to the neutral. So problems like this do not affect every bar. It affects only bars that are closer to the neutral. However, if it is mechanical issue like loose coils in the slot, then it might affect all the bars that we have. Uh, components of the PV systems are sensors. Uh, Iris has more than 60,000 of them installed so far and uh, sensors will be connected to some sort of termination box. That termination box will provide connection to either portable or permanently installed instrument. And data will be collected. This is a picture indicating the sensors installed in a hydro generator. So you can see here one, two, three, four, five, six, I guess, capacitors uh, connected to a state of winding and installed on the perimeter of the circular bus and then connected to a termination box for data connection, collection. The major issue in collection of the partial discharge data is uh, filtering of the outside unwanted signals, which are generally described as a noise. And um, we are using a time of arrival noise ejection system, which basically works on the fact that there are two sensors installed on a state of winding on the same phase. And uh, that two sensors will be connected to the cables of unequal length to an instrument. In the case of the external pulse, which we refer to as a noise, uh, the timing of that pulse arrival to the inputs of our instrument will be uh, simultaneous. And in the case of the signals coming from the inside of the winding, first one sensor and then later a second sensor will detect it. So there will be time delay in arrival of this information to the instrument input. So we'll be able to recognize internal versus external signals. And that's how our instrument can provide information about what's going on within the state of winding, not being affected by pulses coming from outside. How to find the problem? Uh, we propose a couple of techniques. One is comparing the plots or results from identical machines. The other one is comparing the results uh, uh, to a similar machine in IRIS database, and then trending of the results. It's a powerful method, uh, collecting the data along the longer period of time and looking at the changes inside of that time period. Uh, Iris came to conclusion that certain elements of the system are important and some are not so important. So in preparation of our database or statistical analysis of results, uh, we do separate uh, type of the instrument, the type of the sensor. We separate machines based on their nominal operational voltage. Uh, if it is hydrogen cooled machine like uh, turbo machines, then there will be a gas coolant pressure information. Uh, type of installation and so on. What we found is not really relevant for the data distribution we have is type of the bonding resin. So there are different styles of the insulation material used in the last 100 years and machine type being is it hydro or a turbo generator or maybe motor. So Iris PD database uh, has uh, more than 400 test results and it's collected from more than 10,000 machines. And each year we publish the distribution of the QM. QM is one of the parameters it is used to describe the condition of the machine. And uh, we recommend that if QM exceeds 90% of our uh, statistical database reading, then some other tests should be taken or machine should be visually inspected to find out uh, what is the degree of deterioration. Those are the typical results uh, indicating the situation in a hydro machine. So this is a uh, separated based on a voltage and based on an uh, amplitude of the QM signals. And uh, after the first test, the operator can compare his results with the results here and conclude is it in a safe or a not so safe group. To conclude, uh, PD technology is well established method for online monitoring of the state of winding insulation. It is applicable for over dating machines rated higher than 4 kV and the different sensor instruments will be available depending on the choice of the operator how to, to collect data and uh, what to do with the data though, to collect it uh, manually or to send it to a plant management system. Next in a line is a rotoflux monitoring and um, basically it is a air gap flux monitoring. Air gap is a space between the rotor and stator. Uh, that's the place where we put the sensor and uh, 
sensor will be looking at the rotor and the analysis of the data collected from the sensor, which is stationary on a stator, as indicated here, will be useful in detection of the problems on a rotor. So here you can see the sensor in the middle on a stator core, and on the left side and right side there is a one and the other one a rotor pole. Uh, data can be collected again using a portable instrumentation or a continuous in a two flavors, flux track or a guard, and uh, data collected will be displayed uh, in a different uh, types of the graphs. Uh, what we look for is a uh, voltage induced in a coil as a result of the pole passing in front of the coil, and we'll compare that voltage from pole to pole, and of course with the average value for the all poles, and based on that, using three algorithms, we'll be able to analyze results. So to indicate how that thing works, uh, there is a one result, or actually collection of the results, which is the same on left and right side displayed here using two algorithms. So on left side, we compare results to average reading, and on right side to adjacent pole, which is neighboring pole. The reason for two algorithms here is to exclude effect of the air gap between the stator and rotor as a, something that could affect our signal. So this is a machine with 74 poles, which experienced a high degree of vibrations once uh, electromagnetic forces are present. So we compared results on left and right, and we came to the conclusion that looking at the results on left, which is comparison of every pole to average reading of all poles, the shape of the rotor is not very good, because some poles are much closer to the stator than the other ones. On the right side, when we compare pole to its neighbor, meaning, let's say, pole, pole number 4 to pole 3 on one side and pole 5 on the other side, we conclude that in any comparison made on that machine, and there are 74 poles, so 74 comparisons, there is no situation where one pole is indicating lower, lower output, significantly lower output than the other poles. So as a consequence, we conclude that there is no shorter turn. However, the shape of the rotor is bad. So once electromagnetic forces are present as a result of excitation, we will see vibration. And uh, it is not indication of the shorter rotor uh, turn or a shorter pole, but it's indication of the poor geometry of the rotor. So this is another simple to perform online test and also could be used in a portable and continuous instrumentation. And the uh, primary role is to assist in vibration analysis. So people are generally not worried about shorted turns or shorted poles as long as they can operate normally. But in a case of a higher vibration level, in, uh, it is necessary to troubleshoot where is that level uh, coming from or what is the cause for that. So flux monitoring is one of the methods in assisting the operator to find out uh, this problem which is generated by machine, resulting in a mechanical vibration, mechanical or electrical in nature. Next thing, somewhere close to rotor and stator, we are now between air gap and vibration monitoring. So idea is to equip the machine with a number of sensors indicating uh, air gap and uh, indicating vibration on different bearings. So this would be a complete system for a typical machine, and there might be a number of air gap sensors and a number of vibration probes on a different uh, bearings, looking at the behavior of the machine and uh, bringing all that results to a software that can compare a uh, situation uh, when we have higher level and the reasons for that. Would it be mechanical, again, or electrical in nature? Air gap sensors come in different shapes, uh, depend on the size of the air gap, so we can cover different distances, but in any case, there will be a sensor applied on a stator, similar to a flux probe, slightly larger in a dimension, and um, will be connected to conditioner, which is relatively close to a sensor, and after that, the signal from conditioner will be led to a system which will provide the results to the operator. Uh, system can provide a two air gap distance measurement, which means online and offline. So machine does not have to be spinning for this one. And we can measure the air gap in a stationary or in a startup mode or in a shutdown mode. And uh, there are a couple of sensors, actually four different sensors, covering the wide uh, distance uh, range from 2 to 5, 50 millimeters. And depending on the size of the gap, we will recommend the appropriate sensor. And uh, one indication about how problems can be detected, uh, this is uh, on one of the generators, we'll have a unit B here and later unit A. Uh, we are comparing on a top graph uh, uh, air gap information from uh, three sensors, and on the bottom we are comparing the situation uh, with the uh, excitation level and uh, rotational speed. So we can see, looking at the bottom graph, that uh, speed is going down, which is a, 
uh, that line here, and we can see also the level of magnetic excitation being switched off here. So we can compare what's going on with our air gap information on the top. And on the left side of that graph, we can see a one span of air gap information, and on the other end, we can see the smaller one. So this is basically indicating that uh, in a rundown operational mode of the machine, the air gap changed. So indicating the flexibility of the rotor, which is not desirable or shouldn't exist. So comparing that with the unit A, we can see the difference between the maximum and minimum air gap is not changing with the speed, so it's remaining the same. So this machine does not have flexible situation on a rotor, which on a previous slide resulted in a change of the air gap and unwanted situation in operation of the machine. The problem also can be identified down to which pole is making a problem and how big is that flexibility or how much flexure we have in a rotor, so what kind of offset we're going to get. So in this case, it is measured as 8.2%, which is higher than desirable or higher than acceptable. And we can see that which poles are basically uh, blamed for this problem. Uh, it is possible to identify the pole number and then address it with either pole repair or repair of the spider ring, maintaining the distance between the center of the machine and the poles. Next is shaft voltage and current monitoring. And uh, to describe what is the shaft, Shaft is mechanical part of the machine, uh, collecting turbine on one end, a rotor in the middle, and exciter on the other end. So right here on this picture, we can see only top, which is exciter and the rotor, there is no turbine. But on the next one, we can see the complete thing, and it is longer than generator. So there are some problems with the fact that it is a big metallic part in shaft, longer than generator, going through a different um, ambience. On the bottom, it's a uh, water of certain temperature and pressure, then we go to a bearing, and then we go to a high magnetic field, and high temperature, and then we go top to the exciter. So as a result of that, uh, there is a possibility that some of the asymmetries which exist inside of the machine uh, could result in a creation of the unwanted voltage and a current on a shaft. And as a result of that, there might be some problems which could be, again, Mis this diagnosed as mechanical problems rather than electrical problems. So reasons for the high voltage on a shaft could be coming from uh, faults, asymmetries, or magnetized parts in proximity of the shaft, given that we need only three components or three elements in order to produce a voltage and current. We need a magnetic ambient, we need a conductor, and we need a rotational speed. So we, if we find magnetic parts somewhere, we already have a shaft which is spinning, so that's also a conductor and that is enough to create the shaft voltage. Problems that could come from a shaft voltage is a breakdown of the bearing and sealed insulation, and uh, the current flow could be significantly high to produce permanent damage to shaft and bearings, affecting the lubrication properties of the oil and uh, further making that oil conductive and breaking that more easily. So that kind of problems needs to be addressed, and uh, the purpose of shaft monitoring in this case is to detect the poor grounding of the shaft, in most of the hydro generators, uh, there will no be dedicated grounding shaft. Some of the utilities will do that, or some of the utilities will measure the current with uh, some methods, be it directly with a grounding uh, brush shunt or with uh, sensors around the shaft. When it comes to IRIS system, the uh, idea is to detect that quality of that grounding and then detect the shaft rub possibility that the shaft is touching on uh, non-rotational parts on a modern one place and to produce early warning of the problems that could be result or could be created by asymmetries in a stator and a rotor winding. So sensors will be voltage brush shown on the left and the shunt on a grounding brush shown on the right. From the brush on the left, which is voltage brush, we'll be reading the voltage and from the brush on the right, we'll be reading the current, basically a voltage from a shaft, a voltage from a shunt, which will represent the level of the current going from the shaft down to ground. So this is the measurement principle shown on the horizontal axis machine. On the left side will be turbine, then right generator, and for the right uh, exciter. A uh, complete system could consist of uh, up to two voltage inputs and two grounding or two current inputs. And uh, it comes again in two uh, levels, uh, as a truck, single technology instrument, or as a guard, which is a multiple technologies instrument which can cover more than one sensor and more than one technique used for monitoring. 
So summary, uh, monitoring performance of grounding brush is important and uh, this system will provide early warning of many problems and we recommend it to be used as a part of other systems. Together with other systems it will produce better diagnostic and IRIS is not so keen to produce or to provide brushes because they will be custom installed, some people already have them, so our system will come with an active termination box, shunts for the grounding brushes and the instrument. And talking about the instrument, now I have to say something about integrated monitoring systems. Uh, in our nomenclature, in our dictionary, it's called GARD, and GARD 2 stands for the second generation. So here you can see on the left there is a shiny stainless steel termination box, which happens to be the termination box for the shock monitor in this case. Uh, in the middle there is a Iris GARD 2 product, which can collect data from up to three different technologies, and it will be indicated by green LED light on the front panel, so you can see which technologies are active. And uh, in this case of that panel, you can see here, uh, on the left there is a power and alert indicator, so green light means we are okay, red light means there is an alert going on. And on the right side, you can see the three, technolog three technologies light. So that technologies could be PD, flux, shock monitoring, and winding variation, depending on the type of the machine and it's, uh, depending on the type of the instrument connected. In this case, as I said, it will be PD, flux, and unwinding. In a case of the hydro machine, unwinding vibration could be replaced by shock monitoring or something else. Inside, we will have a, some sort of a motherboard where the plug-in modules will be connected. So one module will be dedicated to partial discharge monitoring, and the other module will be dedicated to other technologies, and uh, they can be different depending on the choice of the module. Again, PD technology module could be different depending on type of the sensors or number of the sensors, so there will be more or less of the sensors connected. But in any case, uh, this is something which is field upgradable and can be done in service without stopping the machine as long as the sensors are installed. So there will be a couple of possible layouts of the system. If you have a generator on the left side, F, P and E will be indication of the type of determination boxes. In this case, F would be for the flux monitoring, uh, P will be for the uh, partial discharge, and E would be for the unwinding. So guard system will be connected to a Modbus, and uh, will provide uh, data to a plant system management, and uh, it could be installed in a different uh, fashion on a multiple machines, or it could be installed on a different power plants, and then connected to a system uh, which will be centrally located at utility headquarters. IRIS Application Manager is the name of the software, which is behind the system, and uh, it will be used for setup, uh, definition of the uh, machines being monitored, and then there will be different software packages dedicated to each technology for data analysis. On the left, we can see partial discharge. In the middle, there is a, a round rotor flux indication, and on the right, there will be shock monitoring system data display. So that's the package which is used for condition-based monitoring and uh, today again it's hydro generators. In a couple of weeks or months we'll have a ses session dedicated to um, other types of the machines. And to conclude, there are different online monitors and the idea behind that uh, condition-based approach is to extend the life and to maximize operation of the asset, uh, making the decision which machine to shut down and when uh, based on a condition of the machine rather than based on a calendar or some unfortunate event that would stop the machine. So that's all I had to say for today, unless you have questions, and now we have time for questions. Thank you, Malden. Any questions? I was surprised I didn't get any during the presentation, but now is the time. If you have anything that you'd like to ask. Maldon and I will stay on for the next five minutes, okay, just in case fine. any other questions come through. Um, otherwise, the webinar is recorded, so you will receive an email with the recording in there. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to send them now. And thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.
Okay, we have a question come, that came in. It says, do we need one machine per generator or guard can monitor more than one generator? Uh, depend on technology. If it is uh, flux only, we can dedicate uh, one instrument to up to four machines. However, that is a single technology approach. If you want to combine technologies within one monitoring instrument, which is a guard, in that case you do need one guard per one rotating machine because of the layout of the internal boards. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? You can use the chat functionality on, in your dashboard on the bottom right-hand side to submit questions. Okay, another one came in. If you have high PD detected in a machine, is the machine does the machine turn off or is it only an alert? Well, we were very careful in the naming of the output from our instrument and we didn't want to use even word alarm because we don't want people to be alarmed with something which is as benign as PD could be. So you have a couple of options there. We definitely do not recommend tripping the machine based on a high level of the PD, uh, given the lifetime of the machine and given the levels that could be measured there and still continue the safe operation. But uh, if you decide to do so, which again we do not recommend, it is possible to do because the, our alert relay uh, comes out in a two indicators. One is LED on front panel and the other one is a closure of the normally open, normally closed contact. So if someone really wants to stop machine based on whatever uh, alert condition detected by one or multiple technologies inside of the, our monitoring box, it's possible. But keep in mind that what we are talking about here is a um, condition-based maintenance based on a monitoring. It's not really protection. Things could be slightly different when you do air gap monitoring. So in that case, maybe you want to decide to stop the machine once you see a change in air gap because that could lead towards a catastrophic failure with no significant time warning period, unlike in PD where you see something and it could last for months before something bad happened. Okay, thank you. Another question, can you explain the difference between low impedance and high impedance for PD? Uh, can you repeat the word before PD impedance? Um, can you explain the difference between low and high impedance for PD? Uh, I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, we can take we can move on to that one and we can address that later. Put, put the note down there. We'll open. We'll, we'll answer by email. Okay. Uh, um, if the question is towards the levels, uh, high and low levels, yes, that's possible, and that's the reason why we produce the statistical database so users can, after the first test, see what we measured on uh, thousands of other machines, so he can see and compare his number. But if the question is something different, we'll answer that in email. Go ahead, we have another one, I think. Yeah. Um, dynamic air gap measurement finds its way more and more into customer specs despite that there is no standard for dynamic measurements. Is there any IEEE recommendation regarding dynamic air gap measurements and acceptance and development? Uh, there are recommendations coming from other institutions like in Canada there is CIATI, Canadian Electrical Association, and uh, they give recommendation based on a change uh, of, of uh, a dynamic air gap. Uh, so I indicated in our case study there that we had a uh, 8% and it is higher than 6, which I believe they recommend as a maximum to be changed. It could be different from what uh, original, uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs recommend. In some cases, they tolerate up to plus minus 15%. So uh, I'm not aware of IEEE standards because standards are not so easy to get uh, agreed upon with the manufacturers, but there might be a guide saying something about that. And what I'm quoting to or referring to is a guide uh, published by Canadian Electrical Association, which says about 6% uh, tolerance would be desirable. Um, as a follow-up to that, it stated that the operating condition is not defined in CEATTI, -E and that's what yeah. causes the problem. Well, that's true. and. Uh, 
what we can help with is our experience based on similar machines and uh, based on that you can create your own criteria. Uh, but uh, if you want to use criteria in negotiation between supplier and you as a customer, then it needs to be specified in a specification before you place purchase order. But when it comes to monitoring, we definitely can help you with some numbers or give you something from our, based on our experience, what would be recommended or acceptable. Okay. Um, when is it recommended to use end winding vibration sensor? It's not very common for hydro generators. I agree, it's not very common, but we do have installations. And the reason I didn't mention that technology in, in uh, this webinar is because it's really not very common. However, if machine is of uh, uh, design which might be more similar to turbo generator rather than the hydro machine, which means uh, longer length of the stator core and a smaller diameter, which implies a higher operational speed, and if that machine happened to be also pumping storage unit, which pumps the, or acts as a motor and generator, in that case, it would be reasonable or maybe justified to, to, to monitor and winding uh, vibration because uh, in such cases, uh, there are reports of uh, and winding vibration movement uh, because of the, again, design of the machine and the speeds associated with the pumping of the, of the, of the water. Okay. Um, next question. Can you make conclusion based on the readings from the monitoring on when to perform a rewind if needed? Would it help to know if the rewind it would help to know if the rewind is needed to get some sense of urgency? I mentioned that uh, online techniques are complementary to offline, and uh, relying on only one of them would not be prudent approach. Uh, there are companies that uh, relied uh, on online monitoring in order to select which machine to sh rewind first, and they confirmed uh, their findings uh, or sequence of the events, whatever, by dissection of the bars. So it is definitely useful to have information, but uh, it should be combined with other information that could be collected uh, in online and offline. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the money is driving the world, so someone will decide uh, based on an um, economical structure or whatever are numbers that I gain, rather than technical data only. But yes, we believe and uh, we have a lot of experience indicating that what we measured online on a PD is useful factor in determining uh, to keep machine operating or to go in a rewind. Okay. Next question, where can we see the average QM average measurement that Irish, IRIS is performing each year? You can see it on our uh, web page uh, uh, on a place where we could actually, if I click on that, I probably may end up there. You might see it on my screen. Uh, it would be on a severity database uh, web page. So I'm going to irispower.com. I guess my screen is still visible. Yes, it is. So when I get to irispower.com, I'll click on that place, and that will be the easiest way to explain. Uh, it's on the right side of the screen once you get there, and it's called Severity Table, updated uh, 2013 or 2015, whatever is the, 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 the year. I, we collect data continuously, but we publish, um, what's the name, uh, the paper every second year, and we do gentle updates on, on, uh, on uh, on uh, every 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 year. So here, on online PD severity tables. And so, I can include that link as well in the follow-up email. Yeah. So that's the, basically a paper that is in PDF form and it can be downloaded. And if you go to a previous papers, so this is up to 2013, and you can see results based on a type of the machine, uh, based on a installation method, uh, based on a sensor, and so on. So that's the place. And yes, you can send a link. And also on the same web page, we have the previous uh, uh, papers or previous year's uh, results. OK? OK, great. Is there a defect of, lo uh, defect of low energy on one stator bar far from PD sensor? How is How the equipment can detect it? If there is a detect of low energy on one stator bar far yeah. from the PD sensor, how would the equipment detect it? Equipment wouldn't detect it because there is no voltage sufficient to create partial discharge there, if it is that far. 
So that's a difference between the relay protection and uh, even some state or fault uh, ground, uh, state or ground fault relays are not sensitive to the last part of the state or winding unless they are equipped with a fifth harmonic uh, sensor or assist or a method. So PD is a process which takes place in a presence of sufficiently high voltage and uh, if problems are of mechanical nature and if they are far from the line end of the machine then no PD will occur as a result of that and it will be not be detected by sensor anyway. Uh, if you have other types of the problems which might be surface or something like that uh, happening uh, as a sparking or a vibration sparking uh, as a result of the loose bar or a two conductive semiconductive coating on a stator bar, in that case this would might be seen but it is not PD process and it doesn't affect the state of insulation because again there is no sufficiently high voltage for any voltage failure to happen there. Okay. Do you recommend some limit of QM measurement on offline tests for new windings or individual coils? Uh, we wrote a couple of papers on this subject um, and um, there are some guidelines and even IEEE 1434 guide will say something but not in a QM, it will say in a milliamps as a corona probe uh, sensor um, approach. Um, but it is difficult to recommend anything. Uh, some OEMs, some manufacturers will have their own in-house standards, but they are, might not be <coughs> expressed or measurable or repeatable. So answer is, um, in short, no. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions for Malden? We'll wait just another minute. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to um, view our webinar. And I hope everyone has a great day. Again, watch out for the email that should come tomorrow with the slides as well as a link to the online PD severity tables. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.